It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Over the years, readers around the world have come to regard today's guest, Karen Casey, as a trusted companion on the recovery journey. In 1982, Karen's book, Each Day a New Beginning, defined a genre as the first daily meditation book for women in alcoholism recovery. Today, 40 years later, and with more than two dozen books to her credit, Karen is still writing, taking one day at a time, and connecting with groups all over the world. Karen joins us to talk about her life's work and to celebrate the 40th anniversary edition of Each Day a New Beginning. Welcome, Karen. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for the invitation. I feel really honored, Joan, to be uh, a part of of your circle. Thank you. And Karen, it's an honor for me to have you here today because for four decades, you have been supporting people with their recovery journey. And You know, you've really made a difference in the lives of so many people around the world. How did you get started doing this type of work? Tell us a little bit about your backstory. Okay, Joan, I'm happy to fill in um, the the listeners. You know, my own journey was uh, one of struggle for a long time. Um, I took my first drink of alcohol at age 13. Uh, which really, when you sit in the rooms of recovery, isn't all that young. You find that lots of people have started at that age as well. And um, But I had been chronically depressed as a kid. I had been sexually abused by a distant family relative. And I, um, I was just feeling lost all the time. And I didn't feel the connection within my family that I think uh, a normal child wants to feel. And so um, I was at a family gathering, a big family uh, wedding party, and um, lo and behold, there was whiskey and Coke on the table, and I mixed my first drink at age 13. And I realized that it changed how everything looked in the world around me. And, um, and so that simply became something I turned to for uh, many years. Um, you know, you, you hit a lot of bumps in the road in one's life. And I certainly hit my share of bumps in the road. But alcohol was what I turned to for many years until May 24th, 1976, when I went to my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And I was one of the lucky ones. Um, because that first meeting really changed my perspective on what was possible for my life. And I have remained sober uh, ever since. I I never struggled the way a lot of people struggle. Um, But, you know, I, I think that people often say, why do you keep going to AA after 46 years? And those of us in the rooms, um, who have continued to go, know that what happens for us in a meeting is that constant reminder that we have um, this blessed life now. We have a program for living, and we are able to show up for others and to show them the way. You know, when I think, I got sober here in Minneapolis, where I am again now, and had I gone to that first meeting in 1976 in hopes of finding a room full of people and nobody was there, I wouldn't be sitting here today talking to you, Joan. So we feel, those of us in the room feel a commitment to continue going. So, you know, I've had ups and downs throughout these 46 years, certainly, but uh, the ups have been far greater than the downs. So I, even though now I'm 83, 
uh, I intend to still um, continue with this commitment to Alcoholics Anonymous and for that matter to Alvanon too. I <clears throat> I don't know how many of the listeners are are all that familiar with the connection between Al-Anon and AA. Well, I personally feel as though most of us in Alcoholics Anonymous could probably profit from going to Al-Anon too because of our constant familiarity with codependency and being around others who draw our attention away from the journey that maybe we need to be more focused on. Karen, when you were describing how you got started at age 13, and and you said that you liked the way you felt after you had that first drink. I recently watched the Diane Sawyer special with Matthew Perry, who starred in Friends, and he described something similar when he first started around the same age. He said that after he had that drink, he had said to himself, this is what it must feel like to feel normal. And do you think that is a, a common feeling that a lot of people have when they first drink, that th- that they're not feeling normal, but in that altered state, then they're feeling more like everyone else? I do believe that that's absolutely, and I have heard Matthew share that idea before. Uh, and I think that probably any one of us, uh, and now there are millions of us, of course, <laughs> who have found help through Alcoholics Anonymous uh, or other 12-step programs. But you know, it is, you suddenly do think, oh my gosh, this is maybe how the rest of the world feels. And it's such um, a sense of relief. Um, and that's, of course, what makes it so seductive. Mm-hmm. You know, from age 13 until I got sober at age 36, I was seduced again and again and again by how it helped to change my mood. And I always knew that uh, taking a drink of alcohol would change however I was feeling at the moment. And I, I became like so much, so many of us, a, a daily drinker. And um, yeah. my drink of choice was Jack Daniels. And um, I certainly had that sitting on my kitchen counter for many, many years. When did you realize you had a problem? How, how quickly did alcoholism take hold of your life? You know, I didn't know I had a problem, even clear up until I went to that first AA meeting, which maybe sounds kind of crazy because it had so taken over my life, but um, but you become so accustomed to how alcohol makes you feel. And for me, at least, I can't speak for other alcoholics, but for me, you know, I was a high-functioning alcoholic, actually, <clears throat> in my first marriage which ended in divorce. We were both alcoholics. And um, I was an elementary teacher. And I was, um, you know, I, I struggled uh, to, to feel better. And alcohol made me feel better. But uh, it wasn't really until I was, he left, he left for, um, uh, uh, he was a, had serial affairs, like so often happens with alcoholics, because he was an alcoholic too. He left for somebody else, and I was suddenly faced with, oh, my God, what do I do with my life now? So I started graduate school, and it was, and I ended up earning a Ph.D. uh, uh, from the University of Minnesota. But it wasn't until I started to write my dissertation that I thought, you know, I, I really can't probably do this. And it was then that I thought, Something needs to change. And it was a whole series of somethings that then led me into that first meeting that I went into. And I really, I didn't go into that first meeting thinking that my actual problem was alcohol. I went into that first meeting because the counselor suggested it. And that's the only reason I went. I wanted to uh, comply. And I walked into that room. And I don't know, your listeners might think, oh, this sounds crazy. But I walked into that room, and I looked around, and I had prior to that been um, sitting on lots of bar stools while I was in graduate school, uh, always looking for that perfect man who I figured was going to change my life and make everything wonderful again. 
I walked into that first AA meeting, and I looked around, Joel, and I thought, oh, my God, I should have come here a long time ago. <laughs> Look at this room. It's more than half filled with good-looking men. And it was a room <laughs> of about 200 people. And I, I thought, I, you know, I didn't even stop and think, oh, my gosh, I do have a problem with alcohol. I just stopped and looked around and thought, oh, my gosh, I feel different here. Mm -hmm. There's something here that feels like I've never felt before. I know that I want to come back. And part of it, I wanted to come back because it was full of good-looking men. <laughs> but I also wanted to come back because I was so um, moved by how it felt. Karen, what do you think that feeling was? Do you think it was a feeling of acceptance or was it a feeling That's of exactly support? It. That was exactly it, acceptance. You hit the nail on the head. The people were hugging each other. People were smiling. People, you could just feel that everybody there was being welcomed by everybody else who was there. And I had never felt that feeling except one other time before, and that was in 1974 when I walked into my first Al-Anon meeting. And that also was because it was suggested by a counselor, because I kept going from one um, unhealthy relationship to another, and a counselor said she didn't recognize my own alcoholism. She recognized that I kept going from one alcoholic to another, and she said, you need to go to Al-Anon. And I walked into a meeting here in Minneapolis again, and I thought, oh, my goodness. Um, I felt at home, even though I knew not a soul there. And so there is something quite incredible that happens to you when you walk into a gathering like that, where everybody says, we get you, we understand you, we will help you on the way. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was not the kind of feeling I grew up with in my family. Do you think that I, support, Karen, is crucial to staying sober? You know, do you think a lot of people, they, they you know, they, they relapse because they try to go it alone? I absolutely, I, that's what I personally believe. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I, I can't, as I said, I can't speak for every alcoholic, but, but I am a committed um, and firm believer that if we want to stay sober, we have to go where the support is. And for me, that support has been in 12-step rooms. Yeah. That's where I know that I will get whatever help I need on a daily basis. You said you started drinking because you felt like an outsider isolated, and then your drinking made you feel more like an outsider and isolated. And, and I think that that's probably what happens to so many people. They don't feel like they fit in. And without that support, I can't imagine how difficult it must be to try to, to stay sober and to heal. Well, you know, I, I think that when you are under the influence of alcohol, you can pretend as though you fit in. You can hide from the fact that you are feeling disconnected. And I think that that's the part of the uh, influence of the alcohol. But when you, when I went into that first Al-Anon meeting and followed up by that meeting on May 24th, 1976 in Alcoholics Anonymous, my world turned upside down. It was as though here is the, the actual solution. Now, I still had my struggles, not to stay sober, but I still ended up having some struggles with my, um, with the comfort level. I, I felt that others had a connection with a higher power that I seemed to not be able to, to maintain. You know, um, and, you know, I know that people probably listening who uh, have gone to meetings, 12-step meetings, maybe get this. Uh, not all people will get this, but I would go to a meeting and I could feel the connection because it just seemed to sizzle in the room. And then I would leave and I would so often feel alone again, but I knew the whole desire to drink was gone. I never, it after having been 
a daily drinker and a, a daily drinker of copious amounts of Jack Daniels, it still is unbelievable to me all these decades later that I left and the desire to pick another drink was simply gone. Um, but I would leave a meeting and I would very soon begin to feel that sense of disconnection again. And that's really the key to what led me to sitting in a beat up old recliner and writing because it was that connection as um, with the writing that I could feel the presence of God. And that's truly what, what then changed the, the role I seem to have in life. It felt as though I was being called. I mean, this right. may sound totally crazy to some people, but it felt as though I was being called to do something more. You were talking a moment ago about tapping into a higher power. How important do you think that feeling and, and that belief now was in your recovery? I think it was crucial. I think it's absolutely um, the difference between uh, making it and not making it. And for me, as I had, as I said, you know, I would go to a meeting and because I think of all of the other people uh, in the small groups that, because we always break into small groups for more intimate discussions, I would, I would really kind of trade on the connection that other people seem to have. And I would, I would feel um, their connection. And, uh, but then I would leave, and I wouldn't feel it. And I think that that's the downfall for so many people. For me, uh, I don't know why I never turned to taking another drink. I don't know why I never relapsed. But, you know, in, while I had been working on my doctorate, I discovered, Joan, that writing was such um, that I could write. <laughs> the writing brought me such comfort that I, didn't, that I didn't struggle every time there was something almost mystical that would happen for me when I would sit down to write. It was as though I had a constant companion. Mm-hmm. And so... I would come home from meetings and feel that sense of ennui, and I would sit down. I had an old beat-up brown recliner that actually my father-in-law had given me, and I would sit down in that recliner with not any real thought of what I was going to write. I would just sit in that recliner, and it felt as though God joined me in that moment, and I began to write what I felt and heard. And that, in fact, is what became each day a new beginning. I didn't ever start out to write a book for other women. And and it's almost laughable is the wrong word, but it's just kind of a a stunning thing to me that that book now has been held by four million other women. You know, how did that happen? Well, it happened because there was an intention um, that God was going to join me on that journey. And it feels as though God has been joining me on that journey ever since. I sit down, and I'm not sure what happens, and you probably recognize me from the kind of interesting life you have led to, too, that you suddenly know that you are headed in a direction that maybe you had not even intended to go in, but there you are. And you know it's the right direction. You know that, that there had been in, an intention for you to go in that direction. And that feels exactly how my life has been. You know, it was like I look back at my childhood, and though it was sad in so many ways, I it wasn't because my family was a bad family. They simply didn't know how to show up in any other way. And I think that's what's so true in most families. And so I sought help to alcohol. And I I think that every part of my journey was as it needed to be to bring me to where I am today, having this conversation with you, Joan. You know, I, I don't look back on my life and think, oh my gosh, why did that happen? I mean, how stupid of me. You know, I, I don't do that. 
do that. It's like that God was part every part of every step of the journey. And here I sit at 83 um, thinking, well, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going to go next, but I know it's going to be interesting because that's how my life has turned out. Yeah, and, you know, and I couldn't agree more with everything you just said because everything in my life, the good and the bad, really prepared me for the moment that I'm living right now because I too would not be doing the work I'm doing had I not been through so many challenges in my life. And, and it really is a beautiful thing when you let God in and you and you feel that presence. And, you know, I like to tell people God has a sense of humor. Look what he's doing with me. But, you know, I, I, I can't agree more with what you, you said. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that we're so lucky that we are able to see it that way, Joan, because so many people, I think, don't ever reach that place that you and I have reached. And I, 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 I'm so grateful. The book is Each Day, A New Beginning, Daily Meditation for Women, 40th Anniversary Edition. If you'd like to get more information about Karen and her work, you can visit womens-spirituality.com. Karen, thank you so much for joining us. It has really been a joy having you on the show today. Oh, thank you, Joan. I just love being a guest. And um, and I know that we're both, um, in fact, doing exactly what we need to do in our own journey through life. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.